Hello, welcome, good evening or good afternoon, depending on how you, how you think in terms of time. Um, my name is Gerd Nonnemann, I'm the Dean of um, the School of Foreign Service here at Georgetown University in Tatar. Um, and I know that there will be a few more people arriving, it always happens at these events because of the traffic and parking arrangements. Um, but you're a wonderful group already, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you to this evening with author Manal Omar, about whom and from whom you will be hearing in a moment. We are very pleased to co-sponsor this event tonight with the Qatar National Library. Um, as you may have noticed when you drove past to get to this building, um, the new Qatar National Library building is rapidly taking shape just next door um, in a, what I think is a major architectural statement and designed by the famous architect Rem Golhas. And I'm sure that uh, it will become an iconic building that will be known far and wide. But even before it's finished, the QNL, QNL or the Qatar National Library is already offering a variety of um, online information resources, uh, which you're invited and encouraged to explore. And it's hosting a number of uh, workshops or events, such as the one that uh, we're holding here, we're co-sponsoring here this evening. Just in case I get a few points wrong, I better put on my, my proper glasses. It's especially nice to be able to host an evening here devoted to writing and reading. And to feature in that context an author whose work is so pertinent to the region that all of us live and work in. And I can't resist just putting a little personal touch onto that. Because reading the book and welcoming the author here for me, personally, it takes me back to my own time in Baghdad in the 1980s, uh, to the places and the people and the food um, of that great city. Except, of course, that my time was long before there was a green zone. Those of you who've read the book will, know, will remember or will know what I'm talking about. But even after all the horrors of the intervening years, it's clear that some of that older city's soul survives. Just as it was, in fact, holding on to that soul even during the years of Saddam's dictatorship. Now, one of the traditions that we have developed here at Georgetown University in Qatar is that we ask our students to introduce our guests. And given the kind of caliber of students that we've got here, you will understand why we do that. Now tonight, this task falls to Dima Wahbe. Dima is a rising junior. And in American university parlance, because that which I know not all of you are familiar with, that means that she's about to enter the third year of her university degree here. She's already developed a very impressive record of leadership and accomplishment here at Georgetown. This past year, she was co-captain of the women's basketball team, and she was named the Female Athlete of the Year. She is also the incoming president of the Justice in Palestine Club, and in the meantime, she's also a student worker in our student development department. So, I'm very pleased to invite Dina Wahbe to the podium here to introduce our uh, author, our guest author for the evening. Dima. Good evening. It is my pleasure to introduce our guest for this evening, Manal Omar. Not only is Manal a successful author, she is a human rights activist who is passionately involved in responding to the humanitarian crisis ac across the Middle Eastern and North African countries. For the past 15 years, 
Manal has been working in the field of women's rights, peace building, humanitarian aid, and international development. Manal also focuses on creating a safe dialogue regarding identity in the Muslim and Arab world, and is now working to empower American Muslims to practice the right to vote. She is also a Georgetown graduate with a master's in Arab studies. Manal is currently working with the United States Institute of Peace as the director of Iraq, Iran, and North Africa programs. She has previously held positions with UNESCO, Oxfam, and the World Bank. Manal lived in Baghdad from 2003 to 2005, where she set up operations in Iraq for the organization Women for Women International, which is the topic of her book. Manal has been written and has, Manal has written and been written about in many journals, including The Guardian, The Washington Post, and Islamica Magazine. She was named as one of the top 500 world's most influential Arabs by the Arabia Business Power in 2011, and was also recognized by Georgetown University as one of the 500 most influential Muslims in the world. She is currently located in Washington, D.C., where she continues to work on issues regarding women in Iraq and countries in, trans in transition. Please join me in welcoming our moderator for this evening, Dona Hansen, Associate Director of the Library, and Manal Omar, the author of Barefoot and Bata. Well, good evening, everyone. And it's a very nice crowd. Uh, it was a very short notice event. Uh, we weren't able to let people know very far in advance for reading the book. So it's really nice that people come out to events like this. We certainly enjoy hosting them. And thank you very much, Manal, for fitting us into your very busy trip to Doha. Thank you for having me, and thank you to Georgetown and Qatar uh, National Library for hosting. Great. So you have seen the book as you came in. We do have it available for sale afterwards in the library, and Manal has very graciously agreed to sign them for us as, as well. Now, the, book, the, the title of the book is Barefooted Baghdad, but the subtitle is A Story of Identity, My Own, and What It Means to Be a Woman in Chaos. So this, the subject of identity comes up in this book and also in a lot of the writing that you do in journals. And it's something that's very applicable to all of us here. We all think about our identities. We are all from somewhere else. We are a hyphen. Um, when my daughter is asked where is she from, she has to think, is it the country I was born in? Is it the country my passport is from? Is it the country I live in? So we all are very attuned to that kind of thing. You have more hyphens than most of us <laughs> in your name. Could you talk a bit about identity, the importance of it, and the multiple identities that you have and most of us have, and how that relates with your work? Mm -hmm. I think that um, identity plays a very crucial role, um, particularly because I grew up in, South, uh, in uh, Spartanburg, South Carolina, and then moved to Northern Virginia. So from a very early age, I was aware of the different identities that I had. Um, as an Arab, as a Muslim, as an American, as a woman, each one brought a lot of its own specifics. And for a very long time, uh, I was being told that the different parts of my identity should contradict with one another. And I never felt that. I actually felt that the different parts of my identity really complemented each other. And in the book, I call it my own superpower. I felt that I was able to see different perspectives, different images, and it really gave me an added advantage, particularly because from a young age, I knew I wanted to do international relations. So the role of bridge builder, the role of filling gaps, um, I think my multiple identities set me um, up well for it. I felt it the most strongly when I went to Iraq. Um, Baghdad was the first uh, Arab country that I ever lived in for a long time. I'd always visited the region, but I never lived in the Arab world. And so a lot of the different parts of my identity that I took as absolute truths were challenged when I arrived in Iraq, arrived in the midst of war, and arrived with uh, the desire not necessarily to work, just work with Iraqi women, but really listen and learn from their experiences. Thanks. St speaking of stereotypes, um, in your book you mentioned that you arrived with a very preconceived notion, 20-something uh, assurity that you know the world, you, you know it's black and white, and you, you know what you're going to do. When you got there, they had stereotypes of you. Mm -hmm. Looking back now, you. You're a little bit older, a little bit more experience. How did dealing with those stereotypes, or realizing they even existed, how does that change the way that you do your work? And, and how do you handle that now as you go through areas of conflict? 
I think that there was um, an advantage to um, being you know, a 20 something in the sense that I still had a lot of the idealism, particularly in terms of working in the humanitarian sector. Um, and I had a, a real sense of sister globalhood as well as a feeling as an Arab and as a Muslim, I could instantly connect when I hit the ground. Um, it was a very different reality. There was a lot of questions. Uh, you know, when I speak Arabic, I speak Arabic with an accent. Um, I speak like an American. And so there was a lot of mistrust in the beginning. And it took a while to actually be able to build the trust, to really be able to build the bridges. It wasn't something to be taken for granted. Um, there was you know, a lot of powerful and you know, almost complicated opinions on Palestine and my Palestinian origin. Um, there was a lot of assumptions that as a Muslim woman in America, I chose to wear hijab. Um, so I was very fascinated that arriving in what I'm thinking an Arab Muslim country, um, a lot of the challenges that I had imagined would actually be, be easy to overcome were indeed needed time and needed dialogue. Um, I think being aware of it now when I enter countries is very useful in the sense I don't necessarily address it head on, but I know the background um, and can make sure that through trust building activities and again through open dialogue, I allow people to ask me the personal questions before jumping into the professional activities, which I think, you know, coming from the U.S. is a very different approach, um, particularly in a professional environment. It's not always the first topic of conversation, but I found that it's very helpful for people to know my background, know you know where I'm coming from, know different parts of my history, my family history, before they're ready to really get into some of more of the program activities. One of the, the very humorous parts in the book, I thought, was when you met the men that you would be working with and they were a bit disappointed in you. Mm -hmm. Can you sort of expand on that? What, why, was there, why were they disappointed in you? Well, they had been promised an American. So the way Women for Women International works is there's only one international expatriate who comes in. And so after you know, 12, 13 years of sanctions, they were promised an American who would come and help set up the program. So when I got off the plane, they were not, you know, the way my staff kept saying it is, well, where's the real American? You know, they, they wanted someone who they imagined might have more experience, might have more, um, more ties directly to the government. Uh, and I think, again, through programming and through actually working with them, it shifted dramatically um, when they began to see that there is this multiple identities and there is this different things and that real American was such a broad-based term and really helped kind of open a lot of dialogues about what that actually means. Because after all, America is built on a land of immigrants. Mm -hmm. And so being able to bring that dynamic and that conversation in, I thought, in the end, really strengthened the relationships despite the first day of stereotypes. That they did get over their disappointment. They did. I would like to think they did. <laughs> <laughs> now, your book is set in the time when you were living in Iraq and you were working for Women for Women International. And I have just some statistics that I wanted to share before we discuss a little bit more about that program. Um, your main clientele were widows. Mm -hmm. And the statistics that I found ranged from anywhere from one to three million widows living in Iraq currently. People that, women that went through this program, um, these are some statistics that didn't surprise me, I don't think it will surprise any of you. 90%, 97% of the women that, that went through the program felt that they came out with better health and nutrition information, and they were more likely to be able to look after their families. That didn't surprise me. 89% um, said they were able to actually save some money for the future. But the one that really hit home to me was their, their daily annual income. And prior to starting the program, they were earning, on average, daily, 36 cents. After the program, they were earning $1.21. It's a huge percentage increase, but uh, it just was $1.21 is, is the huge increase. I found very, very, sorry, very, very surprising. Could you describe the program? How did you select the women? How did they feel about it? What did they do in this 12-month period? And, and how, did they, how were you able to help them? with the different modules that were in it. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think one of the important contexts to keep in mind is you know, prior to arriving in Iraq, there were 12 or 13 years of sanctions. Um, and the sanctions really, uh, you know, not only through the economic devastation that it did to the country, but also the social fabric. And so widows you know, from the Iran-Iraq war, and then the widows increased after 2003. So you know, widows that exist today are even larger than when we entered in 2003. Um, so you know, there, there was quite a, a very strong challenge for women because the infrastructure wasn't there, and again, sanctions had really devastated the social structure as well as the economy. 
Um, so what we did was we tried to really target the most vulnerable. And the most vulnerable wasn't o only economically, it was also socially the most vulnerable, widows being among them, but also divorced women. And so we would provide them with job skills training. And this came after really listening to the Iraqi women. And for, for those of you who know Iraq, I mean, Iraq has a very rich history. It's a very advanced civilization. had really progressed in the 1980s. Some of the laws that Iraqi women had in the 1950s were among the best laws in the entire region. In fact, most of the Middle East looked at Iraqi women as the role models. So, you know, to enter in 2003 and see the, you know, the devastation against sanctions and war it had had in Iraq and would continue to have was, was very difficult. And what Iraqi women said over and over is, we get it, we know our rights, we're having a hard time with our daily life. You know, we want to have, be able to save money, to be able to access um, income. A lot of times it was very minimal to you know, buy medicine for um, elderly family, to support the household, support children, again, in the case of the widows. Um, so that's what we heard, and we followed by really focusing in on job skills training trying to make sure that the job skills was actually tied to the market. Because I think this is one of the big lessons learned with development, um, is a lot of times we want to do sewing machines, we want to do computer labs, and it's not necessarily tied to a market analysis, so women may graduate with programs but not be able to earn income. So before we would actually train a skill, we would make sure that there was a market where they could actually earn an income from the skill. And I think that was really kind of the secret of the success of this program versus some other programs is we really made sure and would you know, talk to hotels or talk to um, you know, the, the potential clients before we'd actually train the women. And then once they emerged, they were able to use their skill to earn income. What were some of the more successful skills, the, the, the marketable ones that you were able to identify at that? Well, we were able to um, build partnerships, um, so both with international markets. So, for example, some of the first photos that were on the slide um, was from an international organization called Prosperity Candles. So, Women for Women International um, made an agreement with Prosperity Candles to train Iraqi women on making candles, and then Prosperity Candle would take the responsibility for marketing. Um, and there is you know, several uh, large-scale programs that tied Iraqi women to international markets. You know, recently, Women for Women International, um, I mean, recently in terms of the last few years, made an agreement with Kate Spade. So there was a tie directly to whatever the women were being traded into an international market. But also there was a tie in terms of the local labor market. So for example, in some areas, particularly in the South, um, we found non-traditional women's skills, and I think there were some photos of, for example, carpentry which isn't traditionally a women's um, skill set, but because of the large number of widows and because it was very hard for women to actually access the carpentry because it was so male dominated, when we trained women in this non-traditional skill, they were being hired by other women at a larger rate than they would have been hired by some of the men in the community. Um, so those are two particular examples that I thought were um, very lucrative for women once they were able to learn. And how often would they attend? Was it weekly classes, daily, bi-weekly? How often were you able to, to have them come and, and work on these skills? It was at least once a week for the vocational training, but we also required that um, you know once a month they came and attended. I mean, what we did was to provide support groups. Uh, I mean, one of the things that you know absolutely amazed me, and this is true, um, before I was in Iraq, I was in Afghanistan, and more recently I was in Libya and one of the things that I really really um, continue to be amazed by is that you don't find victims when you enter the country. I mean, Iraqi women, Afghan women, Libyan women, you know, women all over the world, whether we go back to Rwanda, Bosnia, incredibly powerful. So you know, these women weren't victims, they were survivors, uh, they were active citizens, and what we wanted to do was not necessarily come and teach them about women's rights, but have them support one another. So once a month, they would come together as a support group. Um, 20 women would really learn from each other, share their experiences, and that was something they really enjoyed the most, was kind of the, and literally, the women-to-women -women experience sharing and knowledge sharing, and just being able to talk about their daily lives, and, and that was what they did once a month. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. You mentioned briefly women's rights and, and how strong they were in Iraq to begin with. Um, I'm sort of fascinated how they have deteriorated over time. And so if you're looking at the personal status law of 1959, the family law that deals with marriage and divorce, inheritance, uh, the age of, of marriage, it was a very, very strong law in favor of women created in 1959. And in the region, Tunisia would be the only one that was sort of equivalent, and they had one from 1959. While you were there, was it 2003 that Decree 137 
was put forward that would uh, remove these rights and, and move that kind of law back under the religious area. Fortunately, it was uh, abolished after a sh short amount of time. What is the situation there now for women? I think that the situation for women, whether it's legally, whether it's looking at it um, from healthcare, education, the reality is Iraq today is worse off than it was when we entered in 2003. Almost all indicators show that there has been very strong deterioration. Um, we also know that whether it's the refugee crisis or poverty, women bear the brunt of any type of backsliding, and, and that's definitely the case with Iraqi women. Um, Iraqi women in 2003 were really full of hope that there might be an opportunity for them to actually leap forward. Um, with the passing of Resolution 137, which is a very monolithic interpretation of Islamic law. So I mean, one of the reasons why I'm here in Doha is that we can really promote women's rights using Islamic law. It's not necessarily that they're contradictory, but this resolution was a very monolithic interpretation. And so women were calling to expand the definition and to have a larger dialogue. And they actually were the primary reason why it was repealed, as women were able to, um, to, to lobby and have it repealed. Um, unfortunately, it was reincarnated in the Constitution as Article 41. And until today, it hasn't been defined, so there is no legislation. Technically, legally, in Iraq, the law still goes back to the 1959 law. But once you begin to actually put legislation to Article 41, you could see very easily where women's rights legally will actually go, I mean, I would say actually leap back hundreds of years. Thanks. Well, now that we have a bit of a background about what was happening at the time, what you were doing, would you please read for us from your book? I would love and, and to. give us a bit of a um, setup. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm going to read um, the beginning, um, which is literally the first chapter is called The Opening. Um, and what I wanted to do, and this ties to your question on identity, um, was to discuss a little bit of the decision-making process when I decided to tell my family that I was going to leave Washington and go to Iraq. So I'll start there, and then I'll share a little bit of my impressions after a few uh, months living in Baghdad. Okay. The decision to go to Iraq was not mine alone. It was a family affair. When I first sat with my parents to tell them that I wanted to accept a year-long job in Baghdad, they had stared at me in disbelief. My father pointed out that I had a great job in Washington, DC. It was a job, according to my mother, that anyone would kill for. It was true. I had enjoyed working at the World Bank for three years, but I was ready to move on. As a former student of international relations, my goal had always been to directly help people in developing countries. Instead, I was sitting comfortably in a high-rise glass office building in the world's most developed nation. I wanted to do more. Is this your way of telling us you're fired? My mother asked, refusing to be believe any sane daughter of hers would leave a prestigious multinational institution for a small, unknown, non-governmental organization job with half the paycheck. I launched into an explanation one more time. I desperately needed my parents to try and understand that this was an opportunity of a lifetime. I had been offered the position of country director with Women for Women International, a group that helped female survivors of war to rebuild their lives. I explained to my parents that this was my chance to live out my dream of helping communities from the bottom up. My father sat silently. Being a daddy's girl meant never being denied anything. I said a silent prayer that my dad wouldn't start now. I get it, he said. I see why you would want to leave the bank. But I don't think you should start with Iraq or any other dangerous place. We're still overcoming the scare you caused in Afghanistan last month. And I don't think you should go with a small organization. This type of work needs a large organization that can support its staff. His tone was firm, and that was his final answer, telling me that there was no room for negotiation. Bringing up Afghanistan felt like a low blow. I had been in Kabul at the head of a delegation of American women for International Women's Day when the United States invaded, invaded Iraq. The U US Embassy had ordered all Americans to go into hibernation, the, ling the official lingo for laying low. Translation, I hunkered down into the Mustafa Hotel on Chicken Street the most popular expatriate area in Kabul, and watch DVDs. Our biggest scare was a television conking out. If you must help someone, help your own relatives in Palestine, my mother shot back bitterly. I just don't understand. 
Your boss used to love you. Why did he fire you? I sighed. I knew that my mother was a lost cause. My father seemed slightly more persuadable. Then he shook his head. The answer was no. This didn't bode well. He was a man of few words, and I knew that when they were uttered, it would be final. He took his time to make a decision, but once he decided, it was almost impossible to overturn his verdict. Almost. After all, I was my father's daughter, and I inherited the same determination. Thus began a series of family meetings in my brother's basement in Northern Virginia. I respected my parents too much. I would never go without their approval. Meeting after meeting, I presented my case, and each time I was shot down. It was the first time that Omars were united against something, and it was me. Nothing could convince my family that my need to go Iraq was logical. I shifted tactics and tried to get them to see that I had something to offer. My experience and studies, coupled with my background as an Arab and Muslim, were needed in the country. Nobody's in Iraq except CIA agents and preachers, my father insisted. Maybe so, but that just makes it more important for me to be there. I shot back. It was very hard to see my father upset with me. For the first time, my father's face was filled with disappointment when he looked at me. The whole time I had been fighting to go to Iraq, I had believed the only obstacle was my personal security. But I began to realize that I was in the midst of an ideological battle as well. For my Palestinian family, the Iraq war hit a raw nerve. My parents saw the war as a reminder of what happened in Palestine in 1948. It was another humiliation of the Arab world at the hands of the West. And as far as they could tell, I wanted to be a part of it and on the wrong side. The disappointment my parents continued to express caused me pain. My mother cried every night and took every opportunity to wail her woes at community gatherings. At several family events, my mother would complain about her how her daughter was punishing her. If I only knew what my crime was, she would ask. I did everything I could do to give her a better life. I just don't understand it. We, say, take every, we sacrifice everything to take our children out of a war zone, and this one keeps running back in. My father's suffering was less open. You might think you're helping, but you're not, he warned me. The best way to help our people is by getting the best degrees and being the best at what you do. That way, we earn respect that nobody can deny. Your success here in America is more valuable than anything you can do back there. A part of me really wanted to pull back and be the good Arab Muslim daughter but something inside me refused. I really believed I had an opportunity to make a difference. I was frustrated with watching people sit on the sidelines and complain about war and the destruction of Iraq. I wanted to stop talking. I wanted to start doing. We hit a crossroads as a family. Nobody was willing to back down. My father would not agree and I would not stop trying. It was getting closer to the end of June, and I was scheduled to leave in two weeks. My brothers and sister were angry with me for what I was doing to my parents, but I couldn't let that stop me from lobbying to make my case. The reality was, in the end, I would not go if my father did not give me his blessings. This was a line that I would never cross. I knew it, and my father knew it. Yet my father never used his veto power casually. It pained him to stand in my way. I was resolved to listen to his final word, but I also owed it to myself to try everything I could do to convince him up to the last minute. I spent all night praying istikhara, a special prayer for Muslims to help them with difficult decisions. The next morning I awoke with more clarity on the situation than I had in weeks. This was something I had to do. I had just turned 28, and if I didn't seize control of my life now, I never would. I made a final plea to my father. Armed with modern technology, I plotted the best way to make my case. Email. I sent a long email to my father, outlining my arguments once more. The final paragraph read, Dad, it goes without saying that your words will always be the final word. 
I know none of the above can convince you, but at the end of the day, I'm asking you to have faith in me and trust me. I need to do this. I believe I can help, and I can never do this without your blessing. After I sent the email, I drove back to Virginia. When I arrived home, I found my father's brief reply in my inbox. I don't know what satanic force is dra dragging you to a rock, but I do know I cannot stop you. Go and may God bless you. On Ju July 4th, 2003, I left from Washington Dulles International Port for Amman, Jordan. The importance of traveling on Independence Day was not lost on me as I reflected on countless debates I'd had over Iraq's status between liberation and occupation. Despite our disagreements, all my friends and family came to the airport to bid me farewell. I felt grateful for those in my life. As much as they opposed my decision, they gave me the freedom to make it. When the time came, they were all by my side to wish me good luck. Even my mom came to the airport. Reluctantly, she hugged me and through her tears warned me that I may have tricked her da my dad, but she was still not happy with my decision. For that, she promised me, if I died, the family would hold no funeral services. In return, I promised to haunt her. Chapter seven. So I, I go now into after living in Iraq. Eyes wide shut. Charles Dickens understood war. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Over the last three months, Baghdad had been divided into two separate cities, each one an unrecognizable stranger to the other. First, there was the vibrant cultural city. In that environment, I enrolled in the prestigious hunting club in Mansoor and went swimming every Tuesday and played bingo every Friday night. And we ate. Oh, did we eat. Fatty had created the list of the best restaurants in Baghdad, and each night we scratched one more off the list. My favorite was Ceci Bon in Jadria, which featured a large outside seating area in the midst of an elaborate British-style garden. We'd smoked shisha there until midnight. Another favorite spot was Adasat in Hindia Street, in the commercial heart of Baghdad, which was also home to many foreign embassies. The French restaurant Babiche and the Lebanese restaurant Nabil were among the ones we frequented the most. It was a combination of the best of both worlds, east and west. west. Babiche had several Western-style dishes, including pepper steak and pasta, whereas Nabil was famous for its kebabs, hummus, and the best Lebanese salads. Yusuf had a list of his own. Although he lived most of his life in the high-end neighborhood of Mansour, he before preferred the more common areas. His favorite place was Qaduri at the Bab al-Sharji market. The market was the electrical hub of Baghdad as well as a haven for criminal activity. That was secondary to the fact that it had the best kebabs in the city. Yusuf presented restaurants that were frequented by regular Iraqis, and he shied away from the more ostentatious Western-style places. This sentiment was the main thing Yusuf and I shared. I wanted nothing more than to roam Baghdad as a national. We both loved the historic streets of the city and Yusuf volunteered to be my tour guide. I became obsessed with the vibrant art society that was re-emerging. Once a week, Yusuf would take me to a string of shops in Karada that housed the work of, my, of many local painters. I sipped on cardamom tea as I aggressively negotiated good prices with the shop owners. I took great pride in my purchases and flaunted my latest acquisition at every opportunity. During this time, a fourth male employee joined us. The security situation was fragile, and Mace urged that new employees had to be recruited based on strong relationships. At first, I thought this had been set up so Mace would hire a brother or a cousin. Instead, he brought in a childhood friend, Salah. After I saw how easily Salah integrated into the team, I understood Mace's point of view. The companionship between the four men stood as a living testimony of a diverse yet unified Iraq. Fadi was a Christian, Mace a secular Shia, Yusuf a practicing Shia, and Salah a Sunni from the western province of Fallujah. These four men represented different communities in Iraq, and each one introduced me to a different side of Baghdad. 
Salah introduced me to my secondary obsession, walking through the markets of Mutanabi Street. Every Friday morning, I was ecstatic about taking part in one of Baghdad's oldest traditions, the 1,000-year-old book market. The main street spread out into alleys, all lined with bookstores. I loved walking down those paths, finding my way to the streets filled with buildings dating back to the Ottoman period. Named after the famous 10th century poet, Mutanebi Street was one of the main reasons I had fought so hard to return to Iraq. The road fulfilled the Arabic proverb, Cairo writes, Beirut publishes, Baghdad reads. This side was the side of Baghdad I chose to see. My family and friends abroad, however, were reading about the other side of Baghdad, the one that remained quarantined in the back of my mind, the Baghdad that was a stranger to me. My circle of expatriate friends had shrunken considerably due to several bombings that targeted international organizations. It started in August 2003, when a truck bomb outside the United Nations building killed the top UN envoy. The bombing confirmed many suspicions about Iraq not being safe for civilians. Almost immediately, several colleagues evacuated. I had been due at a meeting at the UN Canal building 15 minutes before the bomb went off but I had been delayed at another meeting, a recently discovered ad hoc camp of displaced Iraqis from around Baghdad. The attack was followed one, le one month later by a bombing of the International Red Cross. The Al Rashid Hotel, which had been considered one of the safest places in Baghdad, was then hit by two mortar attacks. In fact, one evening, a mortar came flying by and landed in the garden of the restaurant next door to Ceci Bon as we puffed on our shishas. Yusuf quickly pulled me to the ground, and we lay face down as a second mortar will shell whistled by. Once Yusuf determined all was clear, we simply returned to our shishas. And there you have a, a tantalizing tidbit from her book. I have to say, I like your mother. <laughs> <laughs> I do too. Very good. And would it be spoiling the end if you explained uh, what became of Yusuf that you've mentioned in the story? Well, I mean, I think in the introduction I talk about one of the things while I was in Iraq um, in the midst of chaos, as the subtitle says, um, I found my partner and my husband and I end up marrying Yusuf. It doesn't really spoil the end. It's <laughs> one of the words you mentioned earlier and that is sort of sprinkled throughout the book is the word listen. And near the beginning of the book, there's an Iraqi man, Uncle Fahad, um, who Manal rented a house from. And he said of, of the Iraqi, we are not stupid. We know what we want and need. And, and so you, throughout the book, you were mentioning the listening. And in many of your, your answers, you have talked about listening. When you think about the, some of the things that happened in Iraq, um, and one of them, the, the bombing of the Shiite shrine in Samarra in 2006, which you say in your book is, is something that made you lose the last glimmer of hope. Um, and you wrote in the Olive Branch Post just this last month about 712 have been killed in Iraq this April. Mm -hmm. Has the world listened? And what, what are the lessons that we should be taking from what has happened in Iraq and in Afghanistan and use them looking forward to Syria? I think it's a, it's a very important question, um, and I would say I hope that people are listening because it's a, it's a continuous um, activity. Um, have we listened? I would say just looking back on Bosnia, looking back on Rwanda, um, the answer is no, just in terms of international development, in terms of humanitarian response, in terms of using war as a tool. I don't believe we have learned enough, um, but in particularly looking at Iraq in 2003, um, Iraqis from day one were being very clear about what they wanted and what they needed and the attitude was very much we know better you know trust us let us keep doing what we want to do and we know better and I think that was to our detriment because if we had listened to a lot of the advice that Iraqis were outlining um, if we had listened to what they wanted to do in terms of you know their own country I think we would have a very different picture than we have today 
Um, I, I, you know, it goes without saying every country is incredibly different politically, internally. Um, so it's very hard to compare Iraq and Afghanistan. It's even harder to compare Syria because um, with the context of Syria, you're talking about something that started internally versus something that started externally. Um, but unfortunately, I would say that we still haven't listened enough um, and there is still a lot of room for us, and I think it's true of the international community as a whole, to really step back and, and you know, think, what are the alternatives to war? What are the alternatives to standing by and letting atrocities happen? You know, there, there is a lot of lessons learned. There's a lot of discussions around that phrase, um, but what tends to happen almost every time is we turn into a knee-jerk reactive phase throw out the lessons learned and almost make the same mistakes over and over. And again, my argument is that women pay the highest price for when that happens. Um, they're the most vulnerable, they're the least protected, and you're definitely seeing it in Syria now. Um, I, I volunteered outside of my capacity with USIP at a Syrian refugee camp, um, and it was, it was very difficult for me to see how much of history was repeating itself and how vulnerable women are. And until today, the international community has still hasn't learned the best way to respond and support. Well, we'll move on to something a little more hopeful now. Okay. Uh, you didn't come just to speak to us here when you're in your visit in Doha. You're attending a conference. Could you tell us about the conference and the working group that you are involved with there? Mm -hmm. So I came to attend the U.S. Islamic Forum, um, which is sponsored by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Qatar and the Brookings Institute in Washington, D.C. This is the 10th year anniversary, so for the past 10 years, um, it brings together American Muslim policymakers, um, American policymakers, along with the Islamic world or Muslim-majority countries. Uh, this year, I had proposed a workshop based on the question of lessons learned, saying that over and over we're seeing this window of opportunity open with women only to be slammed shut. What can we do to really look at Muslim-majority countries to support promoting women's rights in the Constitution, but from an Islamic framework? And I think that you know that last sentence is very controversial in the world of women's rights, particularly in the world of feminism. Um, the juxtaposition is automatically, if you use Islam, women are at a disadvantage. And I wanted to challenge that assumption and say, is it possible to use Islam where you actually can promote and protect women's rights in the Constitution, um, but do so where, not, where we're not wearing rose-colored glasses, we recognize the pitfalls, but take the lessons learned, um, and in countries like Afghanistan, in countries like Libya today, the majority of the population, men and women, want Islamic law and see it as a way of protecting. So how can women develop a framework to promote their rights in that? And that's what we've been doing over the last three days. Great. Well, I've monopolized the conversation. It's been lovely, but I am going to allow you to ask any questions now that you've got some of the background uh, for what's happening. We have mics. If you have a question for now, put your hand up and one of the one of our library librarians will come and I have a whole list, you know, we're, we're, <laughs> you can't leave early. Please ask questions. Don't be afraid. Down at the front. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one of the things that struck me in your book um, was the way you, uh, this this is this unites you and with, with what various people have felt in different ways, I guess, is is that when you came in, you were you wanted to help, but you had very very clear views about the fact that the invasion was an occupation and so on and so on. And you didn't want to engage with the CPA and so on. And gradually, and initially, you you had you clashed with some of your own collaborators over this, and gradually you seem to shift and began, in a sense, you, you, you're saying, you know, in some, some form of words, you're beginning to listen, you're beginning to hearing different kinds of voices amongst the Iraqi population. I wonder if you could embroider a bit on that and tell us how that sort of listening also, I mean, think things weren't as clear cut as you had thought. Um, and, then, and also perhaps how that then evolved later on. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because I think one of the things I grew up, particularly in high school and college, was um, with, a, with the word non-negotiable. You know, there are certain things that are just non-negotiable, and this is what it is, and this is the absolute truth. 
And it wasn't until I arrived in Baghdad that I realized that my non-negotiables were now on the table and being negotiated. And that was a very hard reality. Um, part of it was my age, but also part of it was really opening up to the experiences. And I did you know, believe that any type of intervention in Iraq um, was against the Iraqi people's wishes and was, you know, would be viewed as occupation. Um, when I came on the, gr on the ground, um, one of my first trips out was, uh, because I come from a humanitarian background, so uh, the humanitarian background, the first um, rule is, is the code of conduct is do no harm. And so there's a very strict policy on the international code of conduct of not working with any armed groups. And so the CPA and the military are armed groups. So that was one of the other reasons why I had such a strong reaction to working with the CPA. Um, but what I found interesting was, particularly in the South, and again, one of my first trips was to Hilla, was to one of the mass graves, was people actually trusted people in uniform more than they trusted me. And I had anticipated the exact opposite. I had thought that, you know, right away there's going to be a bond, you know, here I am, Palestinian, American, Muslim, like it doesn't get better than this. And it, that wasn't the reaction I got. And, and it took me a long time to actually listen. And, you know, Iraqis were very critical of other Arabs. And, you know, 13 years of sanctions took place and, you know, the Arab world watched. And, you know, watch as one of the strongest countries deteriorated. And, you know, Saddam Hussein had con conducted, you know, unbelievable atrocities against his own people and they saw Palestinians supporting him. And, you know, there was a lot of things that, a, a whole different narrative I hadn't been exposed to. And the more I listened, the more I realized, not necessarily that I was in, a wrong, in the wrong, but my perspective was one of many narratives. And I think that was my first exposure to the idea of multiple narratives and the importance of really listening and hearing the different narratives. Any more questions? Don't be shy. Mm -hmm. ah. um, um, I, I wanted to follow up on your last comment about um, protecting women's rights through constitutions. Um, I think when conflict happens in countries, it, it creates, as you said, incredible burdens on women, but it also creates incredible opportunities for them to sort of challenge um, societal norms. And um, So I don't find constitutions very helpful in really protecting women. In, um, I mean, I, I think men would say, okay, well, it's in the constitution now go back home, you know, and stay there. So what else can be done in countries that are either experiencing conflict like Syria or are coming out of conflict to uh, solidify the gains that women have achieved during conflict? Thank you. Thank you, I think that's a great question. Um, I, I, I think the one lesson learned I have is the importance of constitution and the laws. And this is in hindsight after 15 years, you know, one of the reasons why I absolutely love women is because they're action oriented. And so over and over, country after country, women are trying to get things done or trying to solve the problems. I remember when I, I went into Benghazi, I was asking, where are the women, where are the women? And I finally found one of the women and she said, we're too busy getting the work done. We're in the schools, we're responding to the IDPs, the, internationally the internally displaced people. You know, we're, we're too busy getting the work done. We're not there to negotiate power and positions. And, and I think you'll see the same thing with Syrian women. They're not absent, they're not invisible. They're just really busy getting the work done and they're not negotiating the power base. Uh, but I do think that's a crucial mistake because what happens a lot of times is that window of opportunity, like you said, opens. And the Constitution as a document isn't very useful. But the Constitution as a process is incredibly important because what's happening is you're negotiating a whole new social contract between citizen and whatever government will emerge. And women really need to find a way to be there and be at the table. Um, and again, I think one of the reasons why women are not there is because they themselves tend to divide. Uh, for example, what you're seeing in Egypt, what you're seeing in Tunisia is women are dividing between an Islamicist framework and between a secular framework. And so they're weakened. They're already a vulnerable group. They're weakened by the divide. And what happens is the process isn't going to slow down. I wish the process would slow down. I mean, if you look at good constitution making, for example, in South Africa, it took eight years. Um, but when you're looking at Iraq, it was less than a year. I mean, how can you negotiate a new social contract and you don't even have stability? Um, and it was very rushed. But the reality is it happened and women were absent. 
Um, the same thing emerged in Egypt, uh, the same thing potentially in Libya. Uh, so I think that that's why it's important to kind of think of tools and templates ahead so that you're focusing on the process as much as the outcome. Once you have that, you have a whole lot of work ahead of you, but at least you have a reference point that's solidified in the rule of law. And we had a question on this side, Jeff. في البداية أحب أحيي حضرتك أستاذة منال كمثال جميل للمرأة العربية. إنما السؤال كنت عايز حضرتك أقف عند حاجة شخصية بالنسبة لحضرتك. حضرتك بدأتي التجربة دي عمرك 28 سنة زي ما حضرتك قلتي في الكتاب. هل العمر ده كان كفاية أو التجربة دي كفاية إنك أنت تخوضي تجربة بالشكل ده؟ ده الجزء الأول من السؤال. والسؤال الثاني هل ال ال ما ينطبق او الدور اللي حضرتك قمتي بيه في هذه التجربه ممكن تقوم بيه اي امراه عربيه في اي مكان ولا في لازم يبقى عندها تجربه او خبرات خاصه مثلا عشان تؤدي نفس الدور اللي حضرتك قمتي بيه شكرا. هحاول اتكلم باللغه العربيه حتى اجاوب هي سبيكينج ارابيك اور انجلش ويز ذا ترانزليشنز اوكي فلانه السؤال بالعربي حاول اجاوب بالعربي ولكن اللغه العربي لغتي الثاني وتعلمتها بكبر um, تعلمتها في جورج تاون <تصفيق> فاذا ما بتكلم عربي منيح لومو جورج تاون ايضا اخذت شوي اللهجه العراقي ف ذات شود اولسو بي فن بس يعني اول شيء انا خبرتي كرسميه بدات ب... انا عمري 21 سنه كنت اشتغل مع الامم المتحده Um, وانا um, ذهبت الى العراق ب 97 و 98 كاشتغل مع الامم المتحده. Um, فما كانت اول مره انا بالعراق وكنت اشتغل مع مؤسسه كبيره فهي كانت خبره جيده الي. ورا ما اشتغلت فتره مع الامم المتحده اشتغلت مع البنك الدولي. فعبين ما انا صرت 28 سنه كان عندي سبع سنين خبره مع مؤسسات كبيره اللي هي هيئت هيئتني اني اشتغل مع منظمه غير حكوميه صغيره. Um, طبعا ما في شيء بهيئ لشغل بال يعني بالمنطقه الانتقاليه او وراء الحرب uh, فهي كانت يعني بالتاكيد انا لما وصلت طبعا عنادا يمكن ما اعترف قدام اهلي بس ما كنت متهيئه لهيك خبره um, وخاصه يعني الاحداث اني اعيش بحرب ولوحتي وبيئه شرقيه ومش مع الامم المتحده لانه خبرتي القبل كان مع الامم المتحده منظمه صغيره ما عندها تمويل ما عندها مؤسسه فكانت يعني فعلا صعبة ولكن لأنه أنا ذهبت أتعلم يعني أنا أنا يعني عرفت من البداية أن الحلول داخل العراق يعني إيش قد ما تريد دروسات وبحوثات يعني مثل ما الحلول داخل ليبيا يعني البلدان يعرفوا ما يحتاجوا المشكلة يحتاجوا مساعدة حتى يوصلوها فيعني لأنه دخلت بهاي التفكير أتخيل كان يعني كانت ان ادفانتج الي يعني ف ف طبعا يعني يعني لحد الان قبل سنه انا ذهبت الى قبل سنتين ذهبت الى بنغازي ما كان في طياره من القاهره بالسياره من بنغازي صارت الثوره بالشهر اثنين انا كنت ببنغازي ورا شهرين بالابريل فلسه كان قذافي موجود وطرابلس ما حدا عارف شيء انا وقتيها نفس الخوف اللي رحت ب 2003 ولكن يعني ما اعرف هي جنان او او شيء يعني كان عندي احساس انه اذا انا ما موجوده يعني مش انه اذا انا ما موجوده انه يعني عندي خبره ليش ما احاول اعمل شيء يعني يعني why not try to to, to work يعني فهي هاي كانت اللي بثم يعني ب 2003 والان يعني نفس نفس الفكره يعني كل ما ادخل بلد اعرف انا ما بعرف شيء يعني دخلت ليبيا كل شيء ما اعرف رحت استمع للنساء يعني يعني دخلت مصر قعدت فتره بمصر نفس الشيء اعرف انا يعني حتعلم من من النساء المصريات اي بلد ادخلها عندي هاي التفكير ان انا جاي اتعلم منكم حماس شخصي وديديكيشن وطبعا تعليم وخبره يعني اول ادز اب. ثانك يو. We're reaching almost the top of the hour. There is time for one more question if we have someone that's down at the very front, Jacqueline. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you very much. Um, just my question is about protecting women's rights with uh, or by using Islamic law. I'm talking here about Islam as not as a religion, but as interpretation. Which uh, interpretation you can use? Salafi, Muslim Brotherhood, or Shia? 
So it's really difficult to, to know which interpretation because we don't have really one, one, one model, one, one, actually one, one, one understanding, one meaning of things. Because Islam in Iraq is totally different from Islam in, in, in Morocco or in Egypt or maybe in France. So it's, it's really difficult to, to give just, we have only one, one system or one, it's, it's really difficult. Mm -hmm. So because we have here identities, we have local cultures, we have, I don't know, cultural backgrounds. Thank you very much. Yeah. That's, that's a great question, thank you for asking it. Um, I, I think, I mean, I would go as far as saying Islam in Baghdad is different than Islam in Basra is different than Islam in Erbil. So you know, even in countries, um, I think one of the biggest challenges and, and if I were to really think about it, maybe it's left over from colonialism or something, is this, this, this tie to specifying very clearly the legal laws or, or the legalities. And when we're saying Islamic law, we're saying Islamic doctrine, it's the recognition of my favorite word, which is the process. So if you ask me to define Islamic law, it's like me asking someone in the US to find the justice sector. You know, you can't define the justice sector. It's made of, uh, of legislation, it's made of courts, it's made of a process that leads to the justice sector. I think that within the Islamic doctrine, we need to be open to that recognition. So it's not so much defining what madhab, which is I think a trap we keep falling into. It's not defining the madhab, it's not defining the specifics of the law, it's not it's, you know, the approach, it's defining the process. What are the courts? What is the reviews? What's the appeal process? How many higher courts? What's the role of the religious leaders versus the judges versus the lawyers? And that is any legal system. So whether you're talking about the justice sector in the West or you're talking about an Islamic doctrine in the East, for me it's the process, it's the you know, checks and balances, it's the system that you set up which is the most important thing. And I think that if we take it from that approach, we can begin to unpack this very confusing term of Sharia and Islamic law and madahid and stuff. It's, it's more the process of how we're going to use what we're going to reference. Um, but I think that discussion is essential because what's happening now is you're getting overarching general statements in the Constitution without answering that question. In my opinion, that's very dangerous, which is what Resolution 137 was. It was a very overarching general statement that then leads you to a very monolithic interpretation, and you lose the beauty, the science, and the precedence which makes up Islamic law. One last question for me. A number of our students are in the audience. For those that are considering a, a career in international development, what words of advice do you have for them? Well, I guess the words of advice I would have is to learn to negotiate. I and mean, I think that's one of the things that uh, I continue to teach myself and continue to learn. And it really started from you know, the very first chapter in my book, negotiating with my family. Um, you know, I've been married now for eight years, negotiating with my husband every day. Um, you know, really, you know, in the workforce and, you know, in the work that I do, I mean, I'm technically a professional mediator because I mediate between conflicting parties. But, I mean, that skill set, I think, is one of the most important things that I've, I've learned and, you know, both from an academic but also from an interpersonal communication is learn to negotiate and open those conversations. You know, there, there's ways to be able to really push yourself outside of the comfort zone and push others as well, but you can only do that if you're a skillful negotiator. Well, it has been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank now. you. I'd like to introduce Frida Weed, the library director here at Georgetown, to conclude our evening. Thank you. Thanks very much. On behalf of all of us, thanks, Manal. That was, that was a very interesting presentation and reading. Um, we clearly inspired a lot of conversation, and there will be more. So what I want to do is invite everybody to a reception in our library, where we can continue the discussion with Manal. And as Donna mentioned, she's offered to sign copies of your book. And I think if there are still some books available for sale, they're still available for sale in the library at, at the reception. But before we go there, I just want to thank a number of people. Um, first of all, thanks to John Christ and to Alan Gruen. Um, John Christ is the Director of Research here at Georgetown, and Alan Gruen is the Associate Director for Public Services at the Qatar National Library for bringing Manal to our attention through their um, dialogue with the U.S. Institute for Peace. Um, thanks also to Dean Gerd Noneman for supporting reading and literature and events of this nature over here 
Thanks to Donna for moderating the session. And to the translators for their work. Not seen, but certainly very much appreciated. They are alive there. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, and then many thanks also to the team of bookstore, communications, events planning, facilities management, IT and AV services, library, and a whole lot of other staff members who here at Georgetown helped to make this event happen. Thank you all for being here and for engaging in this discussion, of which there will be more. Uh, it's so good to see so many people interested in literature, in reading, in international development, in women's work. It's just, it's just great. So please join us for a reception in the library where on a few occasions we break with policy mm -hmm. and allow you to eat in the library. So enjoy that tonight. Thank you again. Thank you.